My first name is Casey, C-A-S-E-Y, and the last name is Grover, G-R-O-V-E-R. I am the medical director for the emergency department, and I'm also an emergency physician at Community Hospital for London. Perfect. Okay. Um, so, tell me briefly about today's encounter. So, we've had a tragedy in our community. A very potent opioid called fentanyl is turning up in our street drugs and in the form of fake pills on the street. Morphine is an opioid that many people recognize. Fentanyl is 100 times more potent than morphine. And we unfortunately had the loss of a 16-year-old girl who died in October from overdose on a fake pill that turned out to be fentanyl. What, what is it about this drug um, that, I guess, one, is become so popular, and two, is so easy? It's cheap, potent, and easy to smuggle. So what's happening right now is, unfortunately, is because it's so potent, it's easy to get the drug into the United States, and then it can be used to make pills. And again, because it's so potent, a small amount of drug can be used to make many pills. So it's very, tr very profitable for those who are in the business, if you will, of dealing drugs. And what's happened, unfortunately, is because it's so potent, a very small amount can be lethal. Like even this, the amount of a few grains of sand is enough to kill an adult. So what we're seeing is before, when people were using heroin or morphine, it wasn't as strong, and so there's a little bit of room for error for either street drugs or fake pills. But with fentanyl, if you add an extra grain of sand, you could kill someone as a drug dealer if you're the one making pills. And you know, I obviously went to medical school. We have pharmacists who spend years understanding how to safely make sure dosages are correct on drugs. We have people on the street who just want to make product and sell it, and they have no idea what the lethal dose is. So any pill on the street, any drug on the street could be lethal. Because it's, again, so potent, so cheap, and so easy to smuggle, it's turning up in our cocaine, in our methamphetamines, and in our marijuana. Anything on the street right now could have fentanyl in it and could be fatal. And so tonight's event was to warn our community and provide them with a drug called naloxone, also known as Narcan, which can save a life when there's an opioid overdose. Why is it important to get um, uh, the Narcan out to the community and give the community this information about how dangerous this drug is? Absolutely. So when there's an opioid overdose, it is time sensitive. A person after an opioid overdose will usually stop breathing. And once a person stops breathing, we need to get their breathing started within about five minutes to avoid brain damage and about eight to ten minutes to prevent them going into cardiac arrest. So if a community member carries this and sees an opioid overdose, they can be the one to save the life in time that the person recovers. And in the case of this poor 16-year-old, that drug was not given in time, and so she died. I think the most important thing was probably seeing the suffering of the family who lost their 16-year-old. No family deserves that level of suffering, and we as a community were hoping to come together to prevent another overdose. And one of our psychiatrists who specializes in child psychiatry talked about supporting teens, setting limits, being present as a parent, and being loving as a parent to try to prevent teens from being in a bad environment where they feel like they can't talk when they have questions. And I know as a parent myself, I try to be there when my daughter has questions. And we see our youth in the emergency department, I try to offer them the opportunity to ask questions. And we're going out to schools and offering the students this is what we know. This is the danger. Please be aware, and if you have questions, we want you to ask them. What kind of uptick are you seeing in, in emergency rooms due to this drug? So I think the best way I can quantify it is with deaths. So last year in Monterey County, there were nine deaths from opioids. Total. Total. In 2019, so far, we have 32. So our overdose deaths from opioids have over tripled since last year, and the year is not over yet. We used to be one of the lowest counties in the state as far as opioid overdose deaths, and we will be again above this California state average, which is where we were before all of this work started. In our counties throughout, throughout the, the country, the state and everything, are they seeing this uptick as well too? So fentanyl has been seen in overdoses in Santa Clara County, San Diego County, San Benito County, and Santa Cruz County that I know of off the top of my head. 
but it's unfortunately something that's happening on a national basis. That fentanyl, again, because it's cheap and easy to smuggle, is killing people across our nation. So just briefly what we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of kind of talking about the problem and then um, our colleagues from Valley Health Associates are going to lead us in a training on how to give a dose of naloxone, which is one of the reasons why we're here tonight. Um, and then we'll do a distribution of naloxone so anybody here who wants a dose for themselves can take one home to be able to prevent an overdose in the future. Um, so I think I'll uh, present here our, interest, our our speakers. So Dr. Close is one of our physicians, we wave your hand, from the Emergency Department at CHOMP. Carolina is one of our community members. Dr. Susan Swick is our lead physician for child psychiatry at Montage Health. Guillermo is speaking to us from Valley Health Associates, and Chief Bridget, I put on the spot, is going to provide us a little bit of insight from the law enforcement perspective. So I think with that, uh, we're going to start with our community member, Carolina. Would you be okay coming up to share your, your perspective? Her family member, Kayla, is going to come with. I would like 
to thank the first responders, police department, Seaside Police Department, Monterey Police Department, Montage, for the love and support that they've been able to do. And I hope as a community that this is the end of it and we can really talk about it and bring this awareness. Because there's a lot of hurt, there's a lot of pain after this. Thank you so much for sharing that. To put this in context, <laughs> Monterey County is in the middle of an unusually large spike in opioid overdose deaths. As we heard, we recently lost a 16-year-old member of our community to a fake pill, and we'll talk about the specifics of what's out there and what's happening. And the reason why this matters is we're seeing young people dying in our community, including Perla, who, who died about three weeks ago when she took a pill that she didn't know had fentanyl in it. And I can tell you last year we had nine deaths from opioids in our county, and this year we already have over 32. So I'd like to propose we all take a moment of silence and bow our heads out of respect to honor those who have passed from this horrible condition. Thank you. So um, again, what we're seeing right now in Monterey County is our overdoses and deaths from overdoses are increasing and it's affecting people that never were affected like this before. I know, I, so I'm a long time Peninsula member. I grew up in the PG area, I was born in Chalm. I always thought of people in bad places were the ones that had overdoses. That has all changed. Overdoses can affect anyone in our community as fentanyl as we'll talk about is in so many different things in our community. So again, I'm so glad all of you are here. I think at this point we'll transition to Dr. Close and she and I will be presenting uh, some of the information on the background behind this to help us understand what's happening, why it matters, and how we can all affect the change. I'm going to go to the first slide, just down the logo. So in 2013, uh, we came together as a community in response to what we were seeing at that point um, as far as our overdoses, both fatal and non-fatal. And we brought together members across the community, um, leaders of each of the hospitals. Um, we brought together our law enforcement agencies, our coroner's office, uh, pharmacists, recovery programs. We brought everyone to the table that had an interest in what was happening at the time. And we created from that what we um, call the Prescribe Safe Monterey County Initiative. And we continue to meet, we continue to work on this, and we continue to try to address this on a system level. Um, part of this new response comes from those relationships um, because a few weeks ago when um, we lost Perla and we have a number of other overdoses in our community, we called on that team to bring them together um, to realize what we needed to do and what was happening and to formulate a new response. And a lot of new efforts have come up from that in the last few weeks. And so as you can see here, um, the opiate epidemic, we see it coming in several waves. And the first is this started back with the physicians and with the pharmaceutical companies talking about the safety of these medications and the low risk of addiction and overdose, which frankly wasn't true. And um, unfortunately, you can see that we started with a lot of prescription medications. And subsequently, as doctors realized that we were causing more harm than good for many people, um, and we changed our prescribing, a lot of um, members that were unfortunately in withdrawal um, they had dependency and some had developed addiction. Um, they started using um, heroin and we were seeing an increase in our heroin overdose deaths. Fentanyl has hit us like, it's a tsunami on our, what I consider our community at this time. Um, just watching, I've been following this for years now and to see 
where we were and how we were doing, you can see that we are now losing um, members of our community to these synthetic opioids because they're so much more powerful. Now we have to formulate the next level of our response to this new very imminent threat. So as you can see here, we were seeing very high overdose death rates um, for our community. We started our prescribed safe initiative in response to that in 2013-2014, and we saw an, a literal plummet of our death rates as we reached to physicians, we reached to community members, we reached to law enforcement, we reached to our um, recovery programs. When we reached out, we saw an incredible decrease in our overdose death rates. And frankly, we have been, Casey and I have presented at the White House. I mean, we have been asked, as Little Monterey County, because we're making such a big change, we have been asked to present across the state and across the nation to tell people what, what we're doing and why it's working so well. And then fentanyl came. And, and it's over. I mean, now we're, we're in a whole different place. We're starting over, and then that's why we're changing our outreach right now in this environment is to say we need everybody to take a look. This isn't, we, we've, we've hit the docks. We've talked to the law enforcement. We've worked with recovery center. We need everybody. Everybody has to be at our table now. Next slide, please. This is why fentanyl kills us. So on Thursday, they seized 700 fake Xanax tablets in Seaside, right here, 700, okay? I don't yet know what's in those tablets, but according to the person that had them, um, they had some synthetic opioid. So if you look on the left, this is how much heroin, if I inject it, will, will kill me, okay? It was pretty average amount of heroin for death. If you look next to it, that's how much fentanyl is a lethal dose. And you go down to another synthetic opiate, and that's carfentanil. These are granules. I mean, this is, this is, you know, sprinkle out of your salt shaker. And so if you can imagine, if I'm making fake Xanax in a pill press that we have here, right, and I'm mixing up my, putting in a little fentanyl, putting this, putting some baking soda, putting in rat poison, putting whatever I'm in it, whatever I am putting in there, how much fentanyl is too much in that particular batch? I don't know. And so that's the problem. And we, we had our town, our, uh, our task force meeting right after um, Perla's death. When we had our town, our task force meeting, we asked, well, you know, with the pills, how do you know which ones are contaminated? Anything. And if I make a batch of pills and I put fentanyl in them and I try to do my best to mix them up really well, some pills are going to have a lethal dose of fentanyl and some are going to have essentially none. And there's no way to know. And so what came out of that is my advice, um, I guess at this time, is don't take so much as a breath mint from somebody right now. Because you have no idea what's in it. And we're seeing it in the Xanax. We're seeing it with Xanax, air quotes on everything. We're seeing it in the Percocets. We're seeing it in the hydrocodones. We're seeing it in the meth. We're seeing it in the cocaine. We're seeing it in the marijuana. No breath mints. I mean, literally take nothing. And that's what I'm teaching my daughter, is just take nothing from anyone because you have no idea what's in it. You can see the same on that um, far slide on the right-hand side. That's a lethal dose of fentanyl next to the size of a penny. So you want to think of how careful I'm going to be in my own lab. You can see how I can make a mistake. We have um, been following the media from other counties, and I want to welcome um, San Benito and Santa Cruz County public health officials here right now to work with us on this. Um, but we're seeing at, um, alerts going across the state regarding the fake Percocet is the one that's been the most um, well publicized right now um, for the uh, medication, or for the pills that are having a fentanyl in them. And next slide, please. So these are our agencies. And you may not feel comfortable chatting with a physician about this. You may not feel comfortable chatting with law enforcement, firefighters, whomever. Somebody in this list is part of the home team. And they're here to help. And they're here to reach out. And whomever you want to connect with to educate yourselves and your family and anyone else in our community, this is the home team. And we're trying to make a difference. I just really
lads, I apologize. I forgot to introduce myself. I'm also a physician at Community Hospital. <laughs> I got so excited to get started. Um, one other thing that I think is important to remember is we have a number of people here who are addiction treatment providers. And I think we used to think about overdose was unique to people with addiction. Times are different. You can be a teenager trying something for the first time, as we saw with Perla, and that's it. As Dr. Close mentioned, the drugs on the street have fentanyl, which is an extremely potent opioid, and even one pill can be too much that it's not something that can be saved. So I think an important message to take home as a group here is to talk to our youth and even to know ourselves trying anything off the street right now is a potential fatal mistake. I think we're going to transition to our, our next kind of focus here. Um, originally, Officer David Rice from Seaside Police, uh, who's the student resource officer for Seaside, was going to share his perspective um, on what's happening for, with law enforcement. He has a, an obligation this evening and extends his apologies. I will give him kudos, though. He dragged me over to Seaside High School on Wednesday, and he and I provided a very similar presentation to, to this to the Seaside High School students to be aware that fentanyl is a new and very different danger to um, to what's going on, or what's been going on in the past. So I see we have two police chiefs with us. If either one of them will be willing to share some of the perspectives on what's happening currently, um, that would be most appreciated. I apologize for putting you on the spot. Thank you, Good evening. Uh, Abdul Bridget, Seaside Police Department. Before I share a few words, uh, can we all have another, another round of applause for Carla Perez's family. I really appreciate your courage being here this evening. And from a law enforcement perspective, some of the things that you already know is our job is to put the people responsible for these fake drugs in jail. But more importantly, we would like to prevent these things from happening to begin with. They destroy families, they destroy lives. That's one of the reasons why Officer Rice partnered with Chomp to have a presentation at the high schools. Education is important. It's incredibly important. So that's a testament to you all being here, understanding how important it is to learn about this, some of the ways that you can prevent your children from falling victim to the scourge of our community. And it's not just in Monterey County. It's across the country. Some of you may not know, but we have a regional task force called the, excuse me, the Peninsula Regional Violence and Narcotics Team. They're the ones who were responsible for the arrest last week when we seized approximately 700 pills of Xanax, which we believe might be laced with fentanyl, and we'll get the results back from the lab. Because the county and actually the country has been so successful in reducing the amount of prescription um, opioids, a lot of the fake Opioids are coming in from Mexico. Approximately 70% of all of the opioid seas cross the California-Mexico border. And about 90% of the opioids that you will find on the street that are not prescribed are counterfeit, which means they are extremely dangerous. So that's why it's so important to educate the community. And as has been said here earlier, do not take anything unless it's prescribed to you, because it could be a life or death decision. And beyond, again, just the enforcement component, all of our officers are trained on how to administer naloxone. And since I've been here, which has been about 18 months, we have saved three lives. But again, our objective is to communicate and to educate the public so they can be better informed on how to protect themselves and not fall victim to this dangerous crisis that is affecting many communities and not just Monterey County. But I'm confident in the people that you see here, our law enforcement and also our fire brothers and sisters, we are all committed to ending this in our county. And the collaboration and the cooperation that we have formed over the years, we feel confident that we can make a huge difference. So thank you all for being here, and I look forward to working with you all in the future. Um, so we're going to transition to our next piece. 
Um, and we're going to ask Dr. Susan Swick to come up and speak about some of the various issues facing our youth, specifically how we can arm our youth mentally to take on the challenges of modern life, and also how to deal with a loss like our community has felt after Perla's death. I too want to just take a moment to say thank you to Perla's family um, and acknowledge that it takes extraordinary courage and generosity of spirit um, to come out into the community after the unthinkable has happened to you um, to try and provide some education protection um, for your neighbors. So thank you very much and we're so sorry for your loss. And I'd also like to recognize that there's probably many other people in this audience whose lives have been touched by the loss of someone they loved, to an overdose, intentional or otherwise. Um, and to just say that we see you, um, we're here uh, to hold you in our embrace and to make sure that the numbers of people that this happens to uh, go down and down and down. So I don't know that I have time to talk about how to equip our young people to deal with all the challenges of modern life. I don't actually know how to do that myself. Um, but I would love to say a few words about uh, talking with our young people about loss and what, how to help them if they're grieving. And then to say a little bit about drugs and the adolescent brain and why parents are so powerful. Um, so first, about grief. Uh, adolescents are still, uh, they have one foot in childhood and one foot in adulthood. But when it comes to grief, they are in many ways, probably most ways, a lot like adults. Right? They really um, can understand some of the existential matters that can wash over all of us when we lose someone important. Um, their ability to feel things is full and rich and if anything, a little bit heightened. Um, what they really need from the caring adults in their orbit is exquisite patience and open ears. Um, as you would with anyone you are connected to who is grieving, um, if you do one thing only with them, I would say don't turn away. Grief sometimes can feel overwhelming. The loss of a young person can feel triply overwhelming, unthinkably painful. But for people who've lost someone they love, to also have other people they're connected with turn away because it's unbearable is very hard. So if you can simply show up, you're doing an extraordinary supportive thing. So don't turn away. And then with your young people, showing up and being curious and being able to bear whatever they are feeling with them. Don't be in a hurry for them to get over it or not feel it anymore. There's no hurry in this. Uh, grief is a long journey. Um, so sit beside them and bear it. It can be super powerful to hear from adults they're connected to um, that the full range of emotions they're feeling is normal. Some kids will worry they're not feeling sad enough, that their friends are feeling much sadder. But grief ebbs and flows. It will surprise us in grocery stores, um, and while we feel calm and quiet at memorial services. So being available, curious, patient, and reassuring is the critical piece. And then know your kid, right? Know if they're a little bit more vulnerable, right? If they've been managing depression or anxiety, if they've had other losses that this is compounding, be aware of that. If you are connected to a young person who seems to be prone to engaging in risky behavior to manage strong feelings, be aware of that and be extra connected to them at this time because grief brings some very <coughs> strong feelings. It's natural to want to escape or numb those feelings sometimes. But the best antidote to painful feelings is loving connectedness to other people. Okay, so I'm going to move on and say a few words about drugs in the adolescent brain. Um, and while adolescents grieve very much like adults, 
Their brains are not adult. Um, and it's really important to remember that actually adolescent brains are the time of the most rapid renovation um, that human brains experience outside of the womb. We used to think it was only in the first three years. That's growth. But actually, adolescence is when all the renovation happens for them to become adults. And adulthood happens around 24. For some of us, not until our 40s, actually. <laughs> but from a brain perspective, around 24. And the thing to remember about all this renovation is that it basically primes adolescents to explore, to experiment, right? To go out into the world and try things out, try things on. Um, here's the thing. They're actually excellent at assessing risk. Adolescents are like wonderful actuaries um, at assessing risk. Very, very accurate. They're willing to tolerate much higher levels of risk than most of us adults in the pursuit of novelty, right? And this makes some evolutionary sense. This is how they explore the world. This is how they build independence. This is how they get ready um, to leave the nest, right? To fly out into the world. Um, the other thing to remember, though, is that this state of their brain means that they, have, they actually have hypersensitive reward circuits. So it, it primes them for two things. One, it means exposure to drugs and alcohol um, is, has a different effect on the developing brain than it does on an adult brain. Um, the second thing is there's lots of different sources of intense reward, right? Drugs, drugs are unfair. They're, they're, something, they're between hundreds and thousands of times more potent than most of the normal life experiences that activate our reward circuits. Right? Like good music, good food. There's a reason why the music you heard when you were a teenager is always the greatest music that you ever heard, which in my case is actually true. <laughs> but it's intensely rewarding. Those reward circuits are super powered when you're young. Right? So what you're exposed to is even more potent. We know that for every year before 24, that a child tries alcohol or drugs, their likelihood of becoming addicted to drugs or alcohol in adulthood increases significantly. So even helping young people delay first use is protective. And we now know that equipping them with accurate information so they can assess risk for even one single use is critical. The other thing about these hyper-intense reward circuits it's not just about music, it's about friends. It's about your peer group. And whenever you're either at risk because a young person has been bullied, has felt excluded from a peer group, is new to the community, has just moved here, is seeking to feel included. Or if their good friends are trying it and want them to try. Even if they have great information and a lot of incentive um, to say no thanks, it's exquisitely hard. It's like 10 times harder than it is for adults to do that. So this brings us to why parents can be so powerful. Now this may not feel true to those of us. I have four kids, so I, I say this out loud, but somewhere in my head I'm like, it doesn't really feel that way. But it's actually really true. Caring, connected adults make a critical difference for teenagers in this regard. And I'm going to tell you what you need to do. The first thing you need to do um, is to continue setting rules and expectations for your teenagers. Sounds simple, not so easy, right? Teenagers now have like keys to the car, <laughs> so they feel like, although you actually probably like, own the car, so you get to make decisions. But still setting rules and expectations with clarity, regularly, enforcing them calmly and consistently. Um, and here's the special part of teenagers, explaining why. Why do you have all of those rules? Why do you have those routines? Why do you set those expectations? Because the real goal is to start equipping them to make these judgments for themselves, right? You want, you want them to be ready to start setting these rules down for themselves. So the why really matters. You know, when they're six or seven and they ask why, it's easy to be like, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> why doesn't matter. This is just the rule. And that's actually not a bad response, otherwise we'll get 
caught up in litigation with a seven-year-old, and that never goes well, right? But when they're teenagers, you got to make the time for why. Why really matters. Um, the other piece is to stay attuned, stay connected to your teenagers. Again, simple but not so easy. Um, it's hard when they're out of the house so much more, or when they may be a little more internally facing. And adolescence is a time when they naturally separate from home, from family, from parents. They're spending more time and more emotional time with other people. Um, but here's the deal. They're still connected to you, even if they don't tell you. They're very connected to you. So how you stay attuned to them is by showing up. You keep showing up at regular, predictable times. You pick when is realistic. Look, I know what it is to be a working mom. I'm here tonight. Um, but pick some regular, predictable times. A few evenings a week when you prepare dinner where they do their, have them do their homework in the kitchen. Um, or do the driving anytime you can. Right? Pick those predictable, predictable times. Show up and listen. The key to staying connected to your teenager is to be super curious about what's going on in their world, what's going on in their life, in school, in their friendships. Um, you can't always, you can't cross-examine them. If you ask, they're going to be like, oh no, it's cool, everything's okay. But if you keep showing up at predictable times, when they're at a moment where they need to share a story, or a challenge, or a worry about a friend, or about themselves, if you're there, it's gold. It's wonderful. So keep showing up. And I want, when you show up, you get to sometimes have the difficult conversations, right? The conversations um, about loss, about drugs and alcohol, and other risks, um, and other difficult conversations. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how to have those difficult conversations. I use an acronym because I'm old and tired and I can never remember things, so I need acronyms to help me remember things. So the acronym for difficult conversations about drugs and alcohol is ROTC, all right? So you're gonna bring some discipline, the discipline of ROTC to talking about this with your kids. And the R is for regular, you know, regular conversations. So this means you look for every opportunity to talk about drugs or alcohol, right? You don't wait to have a big talk. Um, but if you see something, and this is where you wanna use found opportunities, there's something in the news. Certainly if something terrible has happened in the community or in school, but often there's things on TV, events with sports figures or celebrities, often, every day. There are events, right, with celebrities, sports figures, and TV shows and movies. And if ever you are watching the same thing, um, and they're there with you, talk about it, bring it up. It's much easier to talk about drug use, experimentation, and strategies for saying no um, when you're talking about someone else than talking directly at your, at your child, which can feel like that. Right? So regular conversations, found opportunities that are a little cooler because they're not directly about the child. They're about the world or about their community. Um, then the O is, I have to remember, O. O is for open. You want to have open conversations, which means if they're telling you about what's happening in school, be curious. Don't assume you know the story. Don't jump to telling them what to do. But keep them talking. Get them to play the movie. Don't just tell you the story. Ask them a lot of questions. Don't assume you know what's going on. And you have to do it in a way that's genuinely open ears, open heart, open mind, curious. You want to hear it all. Right? If you get too upset to stay calm, tag out. Let someone else sit in and have that conversation. But it's so important to be genuinely curious about what they're exposed to or experiencing so that you can really understand. You're not judging, but you are ready to then share accurate information, right? And that gets us to the T. And the T is for targeted conversations. Targeted conversations are different than all these regular conversations, which are much more open-ended. They're about what are people doing? What are you thinking or feeling about that? What are some strategies you might try if someone you really liked asked you to try something? Um, targeted conversation is much more talking and telling. And it's like, here are the rules. Here are our rules in this house. Here's why we have these rules. Here's what we're worried about. Right? It's expectations and rules. And it's factual conversations about risk. Now, if your teenager doesn't believe you about risk, um, then I 
recommend you ask them why. Ask them where they're getting their information. Who are they hearing it from? What websites are they reading? And then invite them. Go look at their website with them. Right? See if you can help complicate their thinking about who's doing the writing for that website and what their agenda might be. Try to visit a boring but objective website like NIDA, which is the National Institute for Drug Abuse, right? Or the CDC has a great website. And actually, NIDA has an awesome website called NIDA for Teens, which has really cool graphics and much better stories, and it's a great place to start. Um, and see if you can complicate their thinking about how to be critical thinkers, critical judges of information. It's, it's a good strategy. So it's targeted conversation. And then the C, the end of ROTC, is actually for contact for safety. Because anytime you're going to talk about what the rules are and what the expectations are, you also have to make sure that your kids know that there's also a break glass and emergency, right? Where you say really clearly, look, I know, I know you know the rules. We've talked all about them. You know what the consequences are. But let me tell you, if you're ever any place and you feel that you're worried about your safety, or you're worried about your friend's safety, or you tried something, and you feel scared, call me. You will not be in trouble, because safety comes first. So you have to critically make sure that you know that there's um, an escape hatch from those rules. And the last thing that I would invite you to do with you young people that really is protective, although it doesn't usually occur to us, as being the most protective thing, is to not just protect time to show up and set rules and expectations and explain why the rules exist and then to talk about drugs and alcohol and sex and pregnancy and sexting and all the various scary, difficult, dangerous things that happen in the modern world. I'm going to ask you to protect time for delightful and joyous undertakings together. It sounds silly. It's incredibly protective of our young people's safety and well-being. This doesn't mean you have to take weekend trips overseas all the time, right? It can be as simple as watching a show that you both love, finding delight in it. And here's a little pearl. Anytime you're with someone that you love, especially a young person, and you notice something that you just treasure about them, they're funny, their crazy dance moves, right? Their ridiculous sense of humor, tell them. Tell them what you treasure about them. Tell them in vivid detail what you admire, what delights you, what you treasure about them. That is money in their bank. It is money in their bank. When they are out in the world and they know what a treasure they are to you, they take better care of themselves, they know how they deserve to be treated, um, and it keeps you with them even when you're not with them. Thanks for your attention and for being here. All right, we're going to transition to our naloxone portion. I'm going to ask for three male volunteers and three female volunteers to help me. And while he souls. steps up and chooses his volunteers, which we appreciate, there are a couple of things I wanted to mention. Um, and I, first of all, thank you so much for our first responder um, response to this event. It's, it's an honor and it's, it's amazing to have you here. Thank you for being present. Um, a couple of other things that come up in safety. I brought a few examples here of options for locking up your personal medications at home. Um, you know, we've all heard about the pill parties where the kids will go in, they'll grab whatever they found in the house, they throw it in a bucket, you try whatever it is, you hope it works. I'll tell you it doesn't. Um, I follow up those cases when they overdose and some of them die. So this is how for legitimate prescriptions that you have in the home, these are options for lock up. Um, they're not very expensive. I know Cap um, Central Avenue Pharmacy down in PG has them. Many of the pharmacies do a lot of different options. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing I want to mention is how to get medications when you don't need them to get them out of circulation. So we have med bins all over the county. If you go back to the prescribed safe slide, if you look on there and you go on uh, medication disposal, um, there's safe med boxes all over the place. Literally the one at Trump I walk up to all the time because people hand me medications and drop them in and walk away. 
So there, nobody's watching it, nobody's monitoring, nobody's paying attention. We just want the medications out of the community. We just put a new drug bin in the Castroville Library. It's ready to go. So just ways to get rid of medications. There are some at home. Medication disposal options as well for elderly family members that may not be able to get to a medication bin. There's a mail back option. Uh, CapRx as well has those. These are a mail, uh, I'm sorry, a chemical reagent that you put your pills in, mix it with water, and it biodegrades them. And so there are choices to get rid of medications, and we have these on the Prescribe Safe website. So a lot of our teens and a lot of our community gets comfortable with medicines because we see them at home all the time. It's no big deal. You know, that was that Percocets, my, my grandma got Percocet when she had her knee surgery. It must be okay. So when someone offers them one right now, we all know that that's entirely, completely, potentially deadly. But they're used to seeing them because they see them in our homes. So just keep that in mind. We have a lot of ways to keep them safe in a home, get rid of them easily um, as another way to prevent risk. And finally, one thing I want to mention, and wherever, uh, where's my chief? Um, one thing that came up is if I am on scene of an overdose and I call for help, am I going to get in trouble? What does anybody think? Am I going to go to jail for calling because somebody overdosed and there's drugs on scene? No. 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 It's a good Samaritan law. You are 100% protected. So our first responders, our law enforcement, our EMTs, our firefighters, our paramedics, they are there to save lives. And if you call because someone is gonna lose their life, that is the right thing to do. You will not get in trouble. You can have drugs on scene. It doesn't matter. They are there to help our community. They, and the officers mentioned it to us at the town hall, they're not interested in the users, you know, not, not our youth that, ac that accidentally have taken a lethal dose of a medication, but even our regular users, that's not who they're trying to target. They want the people that are selling to our kids. That are, I, does that make sense? You're not going to get in trouble. So I just, if I can teach nothing else in our community, I had to learn this myself, is realize that call for help, because then you can save a life. All right, so we're going to do a little demonstration here on how naloxone works. So I have, my men are my opioids, and my women are my naloxone, okay? Here is a hypothetical brain the way the brain works is you have a receptor. It's like a little, almost like a little chair, and a molecule will sit in that receptor and cause an effect. So, my opioids, come on over, have a seat. So these are my opioid receptors in my brain. Thank you so much. Come on and have a seat. So now we have three occupied opioid receptors. So this person, that this brain represents feels the effects of the opioids in their system, okay? And it might be that it's for a good reason. Like if you're in the ER with a broken leg and you're in severe pain, we'll use morphine. Morphine occupies the receptors. It could also be that it's a street deal and we got some bad fentanyl, same thing. The opioids occupy the receptors. And this is how naloxone works. Our ladies coming to save the day have a seat on naloxone or Narcan. So they occupy the receptors. So now our opioids have nowhere to sit and they can't have any effects. So if you're wondering, naloxone blocks the effects of opioids by making it so the opioids don't have a receptor to bind to. So it really, and uh, the law enforcement and firefighter folks can really comment on how amazing it is to see somebody who looks dead and isn't breathing, but by blocking the effect of the opioid, they reverse the opioid and the person can wake up and start breathing again, and then we want to take them to the hospital. Does that all make sense? Thumbs up? Ah, very good. So um, fentanyl is very potent, and what it means is it binds very tightly. So ladies, stand up again, please. 
Gentlemen, you are now fentanyl. Come on back over, please. <laughs> and I want you to sit on the chair and hold on to it as tightly as you can. So what fentanyl does is it binds really, really tightly to those receptors. I think our gentleman in the middle is the, is the most potent fentanyl here. He's got a tight grip. Okay? And so it'll take several doses of the naloxone to rip them out and replace them. So our experience with fentanyl has been is it might take one, two, three, four, five doses if we know someone's taken fentanyl. So just because you give a dose and they don't respond, you can always give more. Let's give a hand to our opioids and our naloxone. Very nice. All right, I think we have our video. And then, do you guys want to get started with some of your stuff? Come on over. So we're going to do um, an educational video on how naloxone works. And then I'm going to turn it over to our colleagues at Valley Health Associates to start with the training. Narcan nasal spray is not a substitute for emergency medical care. Yeah, go for it. As with any drug, you need to be aware of important safety information concerning its use. Please see indications and important safety information at the end of this video. Also, please see accompanying full prescribing information in the use of this product. Narcan nasal spray is an emergency treatment for a known or suspected opioid overdose. The appropriate use of Narcan nasal spray can help you save a life. Narcan nasal spray is not a substitute for emergency medical care. As with any drug, you need to be aware of important safety information concerning its use. If you encounter someone who is unresponsive and you suspect an overdose, first shake their shoulders and shout their name. Kevin. Ask if he or she is okay. Hey. Check for signs of an overdose, unresponsive to touch or voice. Breathing is slow, uneven, or has stopped. Snoring, gasping, or gurgling sounds. Fingernails or lips are blue or purple. Administer Narcan nasal spray as quickly as possible if someone is unresponsive and an opioid overdose is suspected, even when in doubt, because prolonged respiratory depression may result in damage to the central nervous system or even death. Lay the person on their back to receive a dose of Narcan nasal spray. Remove Narcan nasal spray from the box. Peel back the tab with the circle to open it. Remove and review the printed quick start guide inside the package. Hold the Narcan nasal spray with your thumb on the bottom of the plunger and your first and middle fingers on either side of the nozzle. Do not press the plunger to test or prime the device. If you do, you will waste all or part of the dose of medication. Tilt the person's head back and provide support under the neck with your hand. Gently insert the tip of the nozzle into one nostril until your fingers on either side of the nozzle are against the person's nose. Press the plunger firmly to give the full dose of Narcan nasal spray. Remove the device from the nostril after giving the dose. After you have given this medication, seek emergency help right away. Narcan nasal spray is not a substitute for emergency medical care. I'm with somebody who stopped breathing. I think they've had an overdose. Move the person on their side after giving Narcan nasal spray. If possible, put their hands under their head and bend their upper leg forward. This helps prevent the person from rolling onto their stomach. This is known as the recovery position. Continue to watch the person closely. If they do not wake up or respond to your voice or touch, or if they do not seem to be breathing normally within two to three minutes, use a new Narcan nasal spray to give an additional dose in the other nostril. Acute opiate withdrawal symptoms may occur from use of Narcan nasal spray in patients who are opioid dependent. Symptoms include body aches, diarrhea, increased heart rate, or tachycardia, fever, runny nose, sneezing, Goosebumps, also known as erection, sweating, yawning, nausea or vomiting, nervousness, restlessness or irritability, shivering or trembling, abdominal cramps, weakness and increased blood pressure. When the emergency is over, put the Narcan nasal spray back in its box and throw it away in a place that is away from the reach of children. In addition to watching this video, please read the quick start guide that comes with Narcan nasal spray before using it. Talk to a healthcare professional if you have any questions about how to administer Narcan nasal spray. 
Please read the indications and important safety information that follows. Store Narcan nasal spray at room temperature between 59 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 to 25 degrees centigrade. Do not freeze Narcan nasal spray. Keep Narcan nasal spray in the box until ready to use. Protect from light. Replace Narcan nasal spray before the expiration date on the box. Keep Narcan nasal spray and all medicines out of the reach of children. So I apologize, I'm going to steal Guillermo's thunder real quick. So really quickly, they said a bunch of things on the slides about side effects, right? And it makes it sound like it's a horrible medication. Let's take two minutes and talk about what happens. So if a person takes opioids every day, their body gets used to it. When they stop, they get a symptom, kind of a set of symptoms called withdrawal, okay? If someone overdoses and they take opioids every day, when you give them the medicine, you can cause withdrawal. However, when they come to the hospital, we can treat withdrawal. We can't treat death at the hospital. Meaning, if don't ever hold back because you're worried about withdrawal. Save their life, let our first responders transport them to us and provide additional therapies, and we'll fix withdrawal. The only reason ever to not give Narcan is I can't think of one. If you suspect an opioid overdose, save a life and give it. If they have any other effects, we'll treat it at the hospital. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Guillermo Rodriguez, and I'm the clinical director at Valley Health Associates, which is located in Salinas. And I want to thank you for being here tonight just to learn about this demonstration. Obviously, there was the, the victim and the rescuer. So technically, you really want to have other people around you, sort of, you're giving them direction about, hey, go call 911, go get help, go do this, go do that. You're delegating different people to do different duties. Um, for today's sort of training, you're officially all trained after watching this video, believe it or not. So afterwards, um, we're going to be distributing the nasal spray, but we also have the injectables. But today we're not doing the training for the injectables since we have a lot of the nasal spray. So what you're going to be getting is basically this box here, which has two of the nasal sprays inside, like they were talking about the video. We open up as like so. It has the instructions, very simple. One, two, three, four, and how to administer the medication. It's not complicated, it's not, it's not scary to use. It could be very intimidating at the moment when you're gonna actually uh, dispense the medication, but can this medication kill you? No. So if we suspect of an overdose, even though they say I'm walking, I trip and I hit my head, and somebody comes in thinking that I've overdosed or maybe I passed out or whatever it is, they can still administer this medication just the what if, the what if scenarios. It's better to do that. So there's two kids in here. They look like this. I know it's so small up here, but you guys saw it on the video. Um, they kind of explain it really well what to do with the medication. You put it in, your, in between your hands, and with the thumb, you're actually gonna squeeze. So if they're laying on their back, you try to put them on a position where you can get to the nozzle, the, the nostril, put it in there and spray. Even if they're, it doesn't matter how you do it. It's just as long as you get to the nostril and spray it. And with the spray, the medication will get into the mucus area, would be administered, and then all those, I don't know, symptoms that they mentioned, they might experience, maybe not. But most of the time, what's gonna happen is that they're gonna come to you, wake up, they might not recognize where they're at, so just be aware of the surroundings, because they might just smack you, punch you, kick you, not know what's happening. Remember, safety, your overall safety. If you could use gloves, anything you, you might have to for safety precautions, do it. Um, and again, after they come to, they could go back to an overdose mode and fall down again. So you do the second administration, and like they were talking, the doctors were talking about fentanyl, it could take about two, three, how many, four, five? Is there a limit to how? No. So, yep. So there is no limit. So the best thing is to keep using them 
and reviving them. And hopefully the ambulance, paramedics, 911 get there, take over, and your job is done for that point. Um, so that's that. So afterwards, we're gonna get in line going this way. Uh, my colleague Stephanie, who's uh, the assistant director at Valley Health Associates, is gonna support with this cause as well. I'll be on the other side giving information about Valley Health. So Valley Health. has been around the community for a long time. It's making a lot of impact, a lot of wave in the Monterey County and Salinas. So our job, why we're here today is Valley Health is to support the opiate epidemic. Let me get some water. So why are we here today? To address the opioid epidemic with not just youth, not with just adults, but as a community as a whole. It doesn't just impact the substance user, but it impacts the whole community, the whole family. So Valley Health Associates just started a new program, a youth outpatient program, where we implemented a lot of intervention, prevention efforts, and working with the youth as a whole, with the family as a whole, and the community as a whole. So my job as a clinical social worker is to support the families. Like they were talking about uh, being a compassionate parent, giving the information, understanding. That's where we come in, put these practices into place. We develop sort of a contract with the parents to take back home and put these rules into perspective. And I don't know what you call it, the, um, what the four acronym? ROTC, something similar to that perspective to support the parents and the youth. So today I was talking to a youth about just being very vulnerable. I put the paper to the side, the assessment tool to the side, it was like, just tell me what's going on. And pretty soon, within five minutes, creating this very therapeutic intervention environment, he spilled a lot of information, and I was really surprised. And through, throughout this whole session, he was like, don't tell my parents, don't tell my parents. But that's why I believe I'm here today, is to support our youth, support our teens through this transitional period that they're facing of traumatic experiences, uh, growth, becoming an adult, school, high school, and see what life is about. And myself, being here today is a miracle, because at one point, I believe I should have been dead. Um, I'm a recovering addict myself. I, I say the field chose me, I didn't choose the field. I used to work in, in accounting, plugging numbers away in a little cubicle, calling people, hey, you owe me this much pay up, or this is gonna happen. But today, I'm in a whole different type of world. I'm here to support not just the youth, the family, the adults, but it also helps me to continue with sobriety, continue to be a helping hand to the individual. So I just want to end with a note. So I just want to read a poem that somebody very, very close to me wrote at one point in their life. <clears throat> so the name of this poem is called, To Who It May Concern. To Who It May Concern, I sit here in prison for the bad choices I made, I know I regret it and I must face it by doing the time that I got served. I thank God for giving me a second chance at life because at one point I could have died. As I'm getting ready to face society, I must admit it will be tough to keep my sobriety. I hope I won't relapse or fall into any traps. I live a lifestyle that's eccentric which at times society does not accept it. I'm crying inside which I can no longer hide. I don't want to die, so I must control my habits and criminal mind. Do I make it clear? I don't want to die. My friend died on dope, now I must quit the smoke. Here, take the drugs away from me because I don't want to overdose. Will I make it? Not having another hit? Yes, I will make it because at the end, who wants to come back to the pen? Now my recovery is solely my responsibility because I love myself and my family. By serving my time, I've learned that the only high I need is life. Again, I don't wanna die. I learned that the only high is life. Again, I don't wanna die. I'm still sitting here in prison for the bad choices I made, but at the end, I just got saved to who I'm concerned. So this was written in November 2007, 
on a bunk in Solana State Prison, and that person who's very, very close to me is myself. I wrote that. At one point I was lost, never thought I would see the light again, and I believe that's why I say that the field chose me. As a clinical social worker, I'm here to be that compassionate person for our youth and save their life and guide them through a different path and give them a better understanding of what life is about. You know, if they need a male role model, a, a person who's gone through their path, I'm the person here. And I know, like, in Valley Health Associates, our, our logo, our slogan is, it can't get better. And Valley Health is here to support that cause. Thank you. So, I know folks have been here for a bit, y'all have been an awesome audience, we're going to do a couple of quick questions, and then we're going to line up, I think we're going to line up going this way, around that way, to hand out the lock zone. But let's open it up for questions. Yes? Can you guarantee that someone that is around, a person that may hold those, and that person has a criminal record, that may be on post, will not be arrested if they are involved? So let's see if I have our, our two chiefs are still here. The question was, is if there's an overdose and someone calls 911 and that person who calls 911 is on probation, are they still exempt? So uh, according to our district attorney, there is a good Samaritan law, and a person who calls 911 to help an overdose is considered exempt from any pr criminal prosecution and anything that might be on the scene at that overdose. I don't know if we can find any literature, but we can certainly, I mean, it's, it's just kind of a good Samaritan law, is it protects the person who calls for help. We can provide some specifics. We can provide some literature for you. Yes? You said that one of the things was Xanax, and it had fentanyl. How does that happen? It's not real Xanax. And why does somebody buy that Xanax? So the question was, uh, what about Xanax? Why is it fake Xanax? How does one get it? What's going on with that? So the problem is, is that people often choose a substance to deal with life rather than choosing to deal with life. And so Xanax is an anti-anxiety medication, which is highly popular because people feel like it gives them relief from stress. Unfortunately, it doesn't fix the stress. It makes you forget about it for about four hours, and then the stress is just as bad as before. In, in this particular community right now, there are pill presses. They have been seized by police. There are probably more we don't know about. And because Xanax is so popular, people with fentanyl are pressing it into Xanax and selling it as Xanax because there is a profit to be made. So any pill right now on the street could be fentanyl. We've seen fake Adderall, fake Percocet, fake Oxycodone, and fake Xanax. I saw a hand right there. just finally uh, got caught uh, and have been handing out all of these drugs and that helps the kids to think about the fact that it's okay. So what if that problem is still going on and how do you address it? So that's a great question. So I'm gonna put this up again. So the best way to describe the opiate overdose is phase one was doctors over prescribing. We as a community have worked on trying to improve that providing alternatives to pain pills, trying to create guidelines, there are still some bad players out there. You are correct. The second phase of the opiate epidemic is when doctors prescribed a lot, and then people couldn't get their pills, they got sick, they got withdrawal, so they turned to heroin. What we're currently seeing with the fentanyl is not prescribed, and it's a little bit of a different beast. So I wanna be clear that for what happened to Perla, that was a bad pill with fentanyl. Going back to your question, what do we do about doctors prescribing too many opioids? I can tell you we meet on a, with this, with this coalition. We meet with this coalition to talk about these sort of problems about every six months. We've connected with the FBI, we've connected with the Drug Enforcement Administration, we've connected with the DA's office, we've connected with the Department of Healthcare Services Investigations Unit. Our goal is that patients have a right to good medical care and safe pain care. On our website, 
It's Montage Health. You can Google Montage Health Prescribe Safe. It has access to good pain doctors that are responsible, and it continues to be a target for law enforcement in the community to try to take bad doctors and keep them from hurting our community. It's a really good question. Yes? Why is fentanyl so popular and where is it coming from? The issue is, is it's so potent that it's easy to smuggle. So one kilogram of fentanyl is the same as 100 kilograms of morphine. So if, as Chief Bridgen said, if things are being smuggled across the border, what's well, easier to smuggle, 100 kilograms or one kilogram? It's also relatively cheap. And what's really hard about people who have addiction, again, this is something different than what happen when a teenager tries a pill, but when people are addicted, their brain's ability to appreciate reward is broken, and they want the best high. So the example I always give, if I told everybody there's bad mayonnaise at Safeway, no one's gonna go to Safeway to buy bad mayonnaise. But if you tell somebody suffering from addiction, that dealer has dope that killed someone, people seek out that dealer because it's the best high. So that goes back to Guillermo's point that for people with addiction, we must offer treatment and at the same time inform our youth about the dangers of potentially trying to pill. Yes, sir. Real quick, I'm with the Monterey County Sheriff's Office. I'm the detective sergeant. Um, I would look at Assembly Bill 472, start your research there. That has to be a Good Samaritan law. Also, 1799 of the Health and Safety Code covers the Good Samaritan law. Um, it is not a completely get out of jail free card. If you're the drug dealer who knowingly administered fentanyl, the person ODs and you call, we're probably still going to do something. If you're at a scene, you shoot five people, give someone fentanyl, and revive them and call us, it's not a get out of jail free card. What it is is help for those citizens and people who have addiction, who overdose, oh my goodness, we were all using together, what do I do? Call us. You don't get hooked. I worked narcotics undercover for a long time. Just call us. We're not after you. We're after the dealers, the bad guys, the big guys. So start your research there. 11, or I'm sorry, 1799 Health and Safety and 70472. Yes, sir. We're wondering how many treatment beds are available in the county. Ooh, do know the answer to that? How many treatment beds are available in the county? Ooh, wait, I think we have a ringer here. Do you know? Uh, approximately 80. And some are co ed, some are you know, private or medical. All the programs uh, provide medical services, and all the programs that have a dental bed also provide a uh, fee for service. So, do you talk to Sylvia as well? Yeah, there's a couple of detox facilities. So the question was, how many beds are available for addiction treatment in our county? And the answer was 80. Um, they do take Medi-Cal, they also do take private pay, and there are some detox facilities available. Maybe we'll let's take one or two more questions, and then we'll start handing out naloxone over there. So the answer is, is that the model that we have a gateway drug doesn't really exist. However, if you are predisposed to addiction to alcohol, you're also predisposed to addiction to cocaine and opioids and other pills. So it's people who have kind of that propensity or that risk of addiction. They may choose marijuana and become dependent on it, but they're also predisposed to other addictions. The second issue is, is that drugs and alcohol impair your judgment. So if sober, you're thinking, yeah, you know, driving my car, you know, at 90 miles an hour, I'm trying to do, you know, donuts, sounds like a bad idea. After 10 beers, your ability to make a good decision is impaired. And what people tell me in the ER is, I had already done X drug, and doing the next drug didn't seem like that bad of an idea. It's also, when you start to get into drug circles, the people you associate with may be more likely to offer you a drug that you otherwise wouldn't seek out. So it's not really a gateway drug,
but you're already predisposed, you're in a bad environment, and your judgment's impaired. A couple of questions that do tend to come up. If someone's having a stroke, and I give them Narcan, will I hurt them? No. That's just, that's it. It's very simple. If somebody's having a heart attack, and I give them Narcan, will I hurt them? No. That's it. It's really simple. Um, if someone has used soma and alcohol, and I give them Narcan, what's going to happen? Nothing. The Narcan reverses the opiate. Because I have no opiates in my system, and I, I haven't, um, if you give me Narcan, will I wake up angry and frustrated? No. So it's the dependency that can have patients go into withdrawal when you reverse them. What we have found clinically is if you use the nasal spray, it's a much more gentle recovery from the overdose. And so people are, are less agitated. But I gotta tell you, agitated is better than dead. So if somebody's angry with you, take that anger. That's okay. Because otherwise they potentially are gonna die. So I just, those are questions that always come up. Well, I, will I hurt someone with Narcan? No, it's, it's simple. We actually did an injection um, on one of our, uh, on Amy Bravo from VHA at one of our last uh, events. We just gave her an injection of naloxone. Now, what happened? Nothing. You can give it to me right now, nothing. So don't worry about it. Do you encourage people to love up and yell up before they do it? I mean, if, if you had the option to, or just give it? That's why we um, started advocating for the nasal spray with law enforcement. I have personally tried to put together the kits for injectables, and I'm comfortable with needles as an ER doc, and I can imagine in, in that situation, I would mess it up. And so frankly, that's why we advocate for the nasal spray. If I were giving it in this room, I would, I would not, this is my personal risk assessment, I wouldn't worry about it. I would give the nasal spray, I would put them into the recovery position. If they vomit, I would avoid it. But I wouldn't get involved. I would not take that time. I would go for the spray. All right, uh, I think we'll do one last question in the back. Um, so the 80 beds that we were talking about just a moment ago, I understand that they're, those are not for the youth, they're just for adults. And I was just wondering, are there plans to get something for the youth? No. <laughs> So um, at Ohana, we're going to really be focused on the whole range of treatment options for the, uh, for the whole range of psychiatric problems that young people face. And we are absolutely going to be offering treatment for psychiatric illness comorbid with addiction, which in young people <coughs> is almost 100% of substance use disorders. It almost never occurs in the absence of a psychiatric illness. Um, so will we have inpatient detox beds for kids? Probably not, but kids actually don't usually need detox beds. Kids need sustained, um, thoughtful treatment that also brings in the family and gives the family skills and strategies um, to help accompany them on this journey. That's a great question. We're, we're, we're dedicated to, uh, to adding to that service and really trying to improve the health and well-being of kids and families. All right, I would like to say thank you all for your time. I would like we should all give ourselves a huge round of applause. Thank you all for being here. Special thanks to Montage Health Communications and Marketing Department for making this all happen. Special thanks to Family Health Associates. And then most importantly, I'd like to also recognize the courage of Perla's family. Let us come together so that we do not lose another youth in our community.